Yeah, thanks for your help. Mm-hmm. And the batteries are going to run out eventually, and I've got another battery charging over here. So. I'm on top of things. Okay, I have two non proportional polynomials, so they are definitely Li. And they span whatever they span, which is what we're calling S. So therefore, they are a basis for S. But they are not an orthogonal basis for S because the inner product of these two vectors was not zero. In fact, it was two. <laughs> okay, we already did that work. So what we need to do is the Gram-Schmidt process. Okay, essentially, what we do is we start off. These are the vectors v1 and v2. Okay. And then the gram schmidt formulas I'm going to give you. You don't have to stress out. The W1, these are not the same Ws that we were just learning about in Chapter 7. W1 is just V1. Okay? And then W2 is just V2 minus the projection of V2 along W1. And the formula for that what you don't need to know is the inner product of V2 with W1 divided by the norm of W1 squared times W1. <coughs> so all we're going to do to solve part C is replace our second polynomial with a different one that is truly perpendicular to the first one. Okay, so let's just see what we're going to get here. V2, that's this polynomial here, 2 minus x minus x squared. I'm going to subtract some number, okay, we have to figure that out in a minute, and it'll be some number times 1 minus 2x plus 2x squared. Okay, so what is the inner product of V2 with W1? Yeah, it's just what we were calling V and W over here, or P and Q. The inner product is? Two. Okay. So that goes on top. Right? And on the bottom, I have to put the norm of W1. Let's see, what's, which one's W1? W1 is V1, which originally was P of X. I need the, I need the norm squared of W1. Can anybody give it to me? Nine. It's nine. So this is actually the answer. Yeah, Sergio? Um, if we didn't use like the x's and the x squares, if we just did like, you know, just 1, negative 2, 2. Oh, you, you want to go back and write them as uh, vectors in R3? Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't do it. No? No? Okay. Keep them as, they are polynomials, they should be written as polynomials. Okay. I mean, I suppose you could get away with it in the middle of the calculation and then go back and put a final answer with polynomials, but that's not what I recommend. It's risky. I think you're risking it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Off it's off. Stupid stupid. Um, yeah, as long as we're talking about inner products, maybe I should do that. Yeah, Priscilla? Oh, well, you could finish this one. No, go ahead. Um, before you did this whole grand mm-hmm. that part, yeah. you were talking about, like, <laughs> yeah, that that's that. If the inner product of V and W is zero, it means they're orthogonal already. If they're orthogonal already, then this term will be a zero, and you don't even need it. You just have the the, the two new vectors would just be the same as the two old vectors, which just makes sense because if the vectors are perpendicular in the first place, you don't need to use gram schmidt at all. So you would just, this would get you nowhere. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, okay. There's there's one more problem on the review sheet involving inner products. Um, I guess I, I guess I'll go ahead. And, I'll go ahead and do one more problem on inner products, and then I want to go back to chapter one for a little while. Talk about a little bit of the older stuff, and then. Is everybody holding up okay? I know it's kind of warm and it's like Saturday night and everything else, so. Makes things a little tough. My 
voice is a thousand percent better than it was even last weekend. Last weekend it was like whispering. So this is much a big improvement for me. I'm doing a lot better this time. Okay, so number 12 on the review sheet is also about inner product spaces. So this time we're going to take the vector space of C of 0, 1. And I'm going to give you an inner product formula, which is the inner product of f with g equals the integral from 0 to 1 of t times f of t times g of t times dt. By the way, that is not an inner product that I have ever shown you before. We have done inner products on functions before, but not with the t there. We've done the uh, integral of f of t times g of t dt. And that's more what we think of as the standard example for, for functions. So I'm throwing something new at you here. And it turns out that by doing that, everything is still fine. Just part A says, show that this is an inner product. Show that this is an inner product. And um, actually what it really says, which is more likely what I would ask you on the test, choose two out of the four axioms of an, of an inner product and verify them. So let's let's check two of them. Uh, anybody want to suggest two to check? First one. First. Everybody likes the first one? Yeah. It doesn't really matter. So um, I'll check the first one. The first one says that when we take the inner product of f with itself, we have to get at least zero. So this is just the integral from zero to one of t times f of t squared dt. And is that greater than or equal to zero? Sure. Sure. It is. Um, yeah, it is. Sure. Well, we know it has to be, otherwise we wouldn't be asked to do it. But somebody tell me why. No. Sure. F of t squared is positive. What about this? You know what? If I had given you this inner product, It wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't be a valid inner product because guess why? When you do this first axiom, you would have f of, you'd have the same expression, but if you were integrating it from negative one to zero, now the t value is negative while it's being multiplied by something squared. The whole integrand becomes less than zero. You're adding up a bunch of negative area. You would not get a non-zero answer. You get a I mean sorry you would you would get a negative answer. So this doesn't work. Is it, so the actual choice of, now if, okay, if you go back to the standard one, just f of t, g of t, then the limits don't matter. It can be any choice, any integral from a to b, it'll be just fine. But the minute that I put that t in there, right, actually the limits of integration becomes important. Your t needs to be on the positive side of things, which means your limits have to be on the positive side of zero for it to actually work. So let me just say greater than or equal to zero since t is at least zero and f of t squared is at least zero. So everything is at least zero. Yeah. What if f of t was not zero? <coughs> Never mind, it still wouldn't equal to zero. No, this integral is not going to equal zero because this is always at least yeah. zero. The only way that this could be zero would be if f of t was zero. Yeah. Right? So it is equal zero, let's just add that here, only if f is equal to zero. It's the only way. Okay? Yeah. If you were if you were to ask like I'm um, sure that this is not a valid inner product and we had like that um, if we had something like that t and from negative one to zero, all we need to do is just disprove one axiom and that's it. Right, okay. right. And and the only axiom that's gonna be disprovable for this uh, for this choice here would be the first axiom. First, and the way you would say it is you would say, uh, well, actually, you could come up with a specific example. Choose f of t equal to g of t equal to t. Then you're integrating from negative 1 to 0 of t cubed dt. 
You're going to get one fourth t to the fourth evaluated from negative one to zero, and you are going to get negative one fourth, which is not a good answer. You're supposed to get an answer that's at least zero. So you can give me a very specific uh, calculation for that. This is just more practice in showing something's not a valid inner product. Sorry, what was that? Uh, it just would Making sure I didn't screw that up. No. Okay, so we got the first one. Does anybody want to check another axiom? <laughs> Such enthusiasm. Um, actually, the, the, the axioms are, are actually, I think, pretty easy to check for this one. <coughs> because it's just, and then you're just going to use properties of intervals. Just properties of intervals. So for, let's just do one more. So if I wanted to do the inner product of uh, k times f with g, right? there's that axiom. So for this, you would just do the integral from 0 to 1 of t times kf of t times g of t dt. And you would just simply point out that k is a constant, comes out of the function, then comes out of the integral. So eventually it ends up on the outside. There's really, you don't really even need to show intermediate steps here. It just comes right out. You know, sometimes it feels uncomfortable when you're not writing that much down. But there's not much to write down. So that would be showing the third axiom. Yeah, just as an example. Um, If I asked you to find the angle between two polynomials now using that inner product, would you be able to do it? Or would you want me to show you? Say again? Let's do it. Okay, I can do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. This is part B of the same of the same problem. Okay? So let's show an example. Uh, here's what I want to do. Find the angle theta between f of x equals 12x squared and g of x equals 2x. Okay. What formula do I need to use here? The one that has the cosine of theta in it, right? So it would be the inner product of f with g. And it would eat, what's the, what's the formula I need here? The norm of f times the norm of g times the cosine of theta, right? That's what you got to work with. So we need to find the inner product of f with g. We need to find the norm of f, and we need to find the norm of g. So let's do that. The, the inner product of f with g, uh, according to my formula, is the integral from 0 to 1 of t times um, f of, now I like to use t for my dummy variable, so please don't leave x's in this. Inside the integral, they should all be turned into t's. So 12t squared times 2t dt. So that actually gives you, uh, there's a 24 that comes out of everything, and then the number of t's that you have is 4, so it's the integral of t to the fourth from 0 to 1. So what's my answer going to be here? Right, 24 over 5, I believe. Is that right? 24 over 5. Okay, so that's the inner product of f of g. So far so good? All right, what about the norm of f? Let's see, that's the square root of the inner product of f with itself. This would be the square root of, uh, I've got to integrate from 0 to 1 of t times, I've got to take 12t squared and square it. Okay, so I'm doing a lot of things under that radical right there. 
This is just the inner product, t times f of t twice. Right? Okay, so then this is the square root of, let's see, there's 140, 12 squared is 144. I'll pull that straight out. And then I'm left with the integral from 0 to 1 of how much? t to the? t to the fifth, right? t squared squared times t. It's uh, five factors of t, right? The t to the fifth. All right, and so then I'm going to get the square root of 144 over 6, which I believe is actually just the square root of 24. I don't care if you reduce that. That actually can be simplified down, but I don't, I don't need it to be. Okay? And then finally, the norm of g, the last one here, is the square root of the inner product of g with itself. So that's the square root of the integral from 0 to 1 of t times the quantity 2t squared dt. And that becomes the square root of, we'll pull out a 4, integral from 0 to 1 of t cubed dt, I believe. And what's the integral of t cubed? t to the fourth over 4. I, I, zero, at least the limits are nice, right? 0 to 1. So I just get a 1 fourth out of that, I believe. And it multiplies by 4 to make 1. Square root of 1 is just 1. So does everybody believe they can get cosine of theta now? Yeah. So cosine of theta, final answer, is uh, 24 fifths over um, the square root of 24. Uh, I guess that's it. Yeah. Arctan? I'm okay with that. Yeah. Say again? Oh, I thought it was arc tangent. I thought we were trying to get theta. Well, it would be the arc cosine. Oh, yeah. Okay. Of, arc of arc that arc. answer. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, no worries. Does that make sense? <laughs> Everybody okay, okay with that again? <laughs> So we, um, let me sort of assess where we're at here, because we've been at it for a while. We, uh, in my opinion, we've talked quite a bit about chapters four and five, pretty much all of that stuff, with the exception of the last part of chapter five on diagonalization. Most of the stuff on the last part of chapter five and six and seven, the stuff we just talked about last week, right? And the stuff in chapters 2 and 3, yeah, that's mostly just about uh, EROs and determinants and stuff like that. There are a few things there. Does everybody still know how to find the inverse of a matrix? Yep. Uh, even, even for a larger than 2 by 2. Yeah, that's how you find it. Maybe this should have been on the list as well. Isn't that the adjoint method or something? Yeah. The adjoint of the matrix. That's where you uh, that's where you write down the cofactors. And then you transpose them. So this is this is literally just a one over the determinant times the transpose of the matrix of cofactors. So you need to refresh your memory. The cofactors that's just where you go through your matrix, you cross off the row and column of the spot you're looking at, and you take the determinant of the submatrix um, and possibly change the sign based on the odd even pattern, right? So you, you have to remember you have to remember this pattern. And that's okay. that's the kind of matrix is um, the original of three or a three by three or higher. Yeah, but the two by two you don't have to use this. Just so use just use the nice formula for the inverse of the two by two. Yeah, you should remember how to do that. There's also another method though. Kevin? Yeah, I was going to say, could you use the Gauss-Jordan one as well? Yeah, the Gauss. So this is the adjoint method. Oh, I love the Gauss-Jordan. The, the Gauss-Jordan method is where you take your matrix, you attach an identity matrix to the side of it. I like that. Yeah. And you do your er. The thing, the trouble with this method, of course, is you got to do a lot of eros. Is that, it, 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 it's which one, okay. pick your poison. Do you like doing cofactors or do you like doing EROs? It's uh, kind of one or the other. And you keep going until you get the identity matrix on the left, 
And at the moment that that becomes the identity matrix, whatever is on the right side is your A inverse. Wait. Um, yeah, sure. just avoiding ERO's. Yeah. No, but you, this, you, you utilize it with another, with other things to find it. I remember a test question, you had to do the adjoint and build. Yeah. 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 Are you thinking of the Kramer's rule? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you're thinking of Kramer's rule, because that was on the midterm. Yeah, they just, I, I, I think so. Let me, let me mention that in a second, but I've got a lot of hands in there. First, the ERO method, we don't have to worry about side changes, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, when we do the, the switching of the signs, we only use that when we're doing like cofactor expansion. Uh, you also do that when you're just writing down the matrix of cofactors. Yeah. Um, the, here's the thing. Here's the trouble with the Gauss-Jordan method. The trouble with the Gauss-Jordan method is if you start getting fractions. Your life is miserable. It becomes very difficult to do it without making mistakes. The, 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 the adjoint method, the adjoint method tends to pull the fraction out because the determinant comes out. Yeah, you have a fraction there, but that determinant sort of extracts it so it's not in the way. And the actual adjoint, which is the matrix of cofactors transpose, is usually a pretty clean matrix, right? So personally, I don't know, I'm more of a go this way with it myself. I, I'm okay with trying to remember this and um, put that stuff in there. But it, it's, you know, if I don't tell you you have to do it a certain way, then you can do it whatever way you want. Question? So the matrix is for each spot, you have to multiply by what's in the... You, you that's, when you do, that's when you're co-packer expanding a row or a column. Just do whatever not inside that area in that spot. Yeah. 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 That's right. Um, I tell you what, maybe, maybe we should do an example of this. It's not in the review session question. Would that be good? Yeah. All right, I'm going to grab, I'm going to cheat. Mistakes. I must have written this down. Uh, uh, it could be two. Uh, 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 okay. All right, guys, we're making up a problem that's not in the review pack. Okay, here's an example. We're going to use Kramer's rule. Oh, yeah. You guys use this in your engineering classes, right? So this should be agreed. No, you don't use it? I do. Some of you do. Okay, so, all right, so x1 minus x2 plus x3 equals 2, and then 4x1 plus 5x2 plus 3x3 equals 0, and then 4x1 minus 3x2 plus 3x3 equals 2. So we're just going to solve a little system here. Adi? Both sides into matrix and then... Um, Wait, you tell me how to do it already? Hold on. I'm not quite ready for that. <laughs> Let everybody write it down first. I'll come back to you in a second. Give my hand a chance to recover. All the writing. Okay, so this one is, is not um, in the review questions. Okay, here's what you want to do. You'll want to write down the coefficient matrix, right? That's what you were telling me. Yeah, Perfect. So what is the coefficient matrix? Okay. And then we have a right hand side vector. It was 2, 0, 2. Right? And this is really just the system AX equals B. So AX equals B. One way to solve the system would be to just simply find A inverse. Right? If I'm solving for X right here, one way to solve for X would be literally to just take A inverse and multiply it by B. Correct? 
<laughs> but a, of course, I, in finding a inverse, I can do that. I can do that by this method if I wanted to. But what the Kramer's rule does is it kind of says, no, you don't actually have to find the inverse of a. You have three variables here that you're trying to find, and the formulas are as follows. Um, basically, you divide by the determinant of the coefficient matrix. Actually, so you, so you do this for all three of them. Can somebody find the determinant of this? <laughs> Just use the arrow method. What test is this on? By the way, when um, this is on the first midterm, first midterm material. Um, when you have a three by three matrix of numbers, the arrow method is good. It's when you're finding eigenvalues that we did later in the semester where you subtracted lambdas off of the main diagonal. That's when the arrow method is not factoring the expression very nicely for you, and you're better off trying to cofactor expand, assuming you have a matrix that has some nice zeros in it, which this one does not. But you can just use the arrow method here. So does anybody have the answer for this? Determine it? Hmm? 16? Anybody else have an answer yet? 16? Anybody else have an answer yet? 16. Okay, good. Everybody's got 16. Must be right. 16. Okay. So um, I'm going to take your word for it. <laughs> now, do you guys know what you do in the numerators? You put the B into the correct column that you want, right? So, so up here, you take the determinant. So for the first one, you'll put the 202 in the first column. Okay, so you guys know how to do this. Yeah. I don't really need to do the whole thing. Just a refresher. The second, second one, we put the 202 in the middle column. We leave the first column the same and the third column the same. And then down here, I put the 202 in the third column. And you guys just have to calculate these numbers. We should give us one with a B is one zero zero so you can put back or stay in all the Right. That would be the answer. Okay. Can I skip doing the whole calculation? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is called uh, right, this is called um, this is called B one. And this in the book it's called B two. Okay. And this one's called B three. Okay. Right. Um, and is everybody good with this adjoint thing? Okay, need to review it. Yeah. Make sure that you can find cofactors and make this matrix of cofactors and transpose it. Okay. Transpose is where you switch the rows and columns. You reflect that matrix along the main diagonal. Yeah, definitely need to know how to do that. Um, let's do a problem out of chapter one. Small. I'm going to do number nine. <laughs> y prime minus 3 over 2x times y equals 6y to the 1 third x squared ln of x. Oh, you guys are fast. <laughs> this is good. This is good if you recognize it right away. I mean, yes, you're on top of it. Yeah, so it looks almost... <laughs> <laughs> it looks almost linear. It would be linear if it wasn't for that y to the one third. So without that y to the one third, it would be already linear. So, if it, it, but it's not quite linear. It's close to that. Um, the left hand side looks very linear. It's the right hand side, it's not. So how do we approach the Bernoulli one? Okay, so we do the u thing. So u is equal to what's the formula? One minus one minus n. What is n in this case? N is just the power of the y, right? 
Remember that if it's on the bottom of a fraction, then that, that would be in constitute a negative.